Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really happy to see everybody here. Um, this is an event we've been trying to put on for over a year. And so I'd like to thank everybody for your patience. I think we all understand what the issues were. Uh, we finally felt it was safe enough to have this gathering. And the purpose of this is to introduce uh, a new event for the school. Uh, this is an event, I believe, uh, is an important one, both for the scientific culture of the school and also to recognize the contributions of one of its most important members. Actually, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to step back and talk about those contributions and put them in a context which I believe shouldn't be forgotten. I think we've all heard this expression, like standing on the shoulders of giants. I actually believe the School of Molecular Sciences stands on the shoulders of the original Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry here at ASU. And, it, and that builds on a lot of truly outstanding and creative work that came out of the original department. In the scientific rankings that actually matter, ASU in chemistry and biochemistry always comes out close to the top. In 2011, Thomson Reuters did a study of scientific impact of publications, and ASU was ranked number six worldwide, ahead of MIT, head of Stanford, head of Michigan and UCLA. He's not watching, but not Berkeley. <laughs> you know, that work was done by an incredible group of really powerful and creative scientists. And there are a lot of them. Uh, for instance, and this, this group includes Peter Busick, Carlton Moore, Bob Pettit, Austin Angel, of course, Tom and Anna and Devons and many others. And so the school is really indebted to this group of people. And the person who's probably at the top of that list would be Mike. Mike O'Keefe was the third most cited chemist in the world in the first decade of the new millennium. Mike has been doing groundbreaking work on the atomic and electronic structure of crystal materials at ASU for decades. He's made really important contributions, not just in MOFs, uh, I'm not going to summarize Mike's career today, all right? In fact, I'd encourage you to take a look at a beautiful video that's put together by Peter. And if you don't know the link to the video, send me an email, I'll send it to you. But Mike's contributions were, we say, went well beyond just morphs. Uh, Mike wrote a paper on valence bond parameters and crystal chemistry. It's been cited over 6,000 times. He was the first to characterize the electronic structure of a meteorite by electron microscopy on its own. He and John Spence, of course, Developed, observed, made the first observations of atomic orbitals. And then, of course, in a conversation with Omar, when they were discussing certain structure, Mike said, can you synthesize this thing? Omar said, of course we can synthesize this thing, not knowing if he could. And of course he did, as the first morph, and the rest is history. Mike is one of the most, one of the best, but most humble scientists I think I've met. He has been recognized. I would say that Mike is under-recognized, actually, but he has, he has received recognition. He was a Bernal Distinguished Lecturer. He had received a world-class professorship at KIST in Korea. He won the Newcomb Cleveland Prize, prize in AAAS. So did Omar. In 2019, he, the, he was awarded the Aminoff Prize, along with Omar. Mike has over 100,000 citations and an H index of over 100. The school, since the department, of course, has grown in diversity and grown very rapidly um, to the point where we found that it's putting a strain on the standard weekly seminars, right? You know, how do we find uh, speakers who, uh, who are actually broad enough to appeal to the entire, the entire SMS community? So we decided to split the seminar series into two. So we have specialized seminars, and they are seminars which are reserved for speakers whose work is so broad and impactful that the entire school will be interested in it. So hence we have the O'Keefe Lecture Series. Mike's work has been so beautiful, so broad and impactful that I can't think of a better name to go to describe the spirit of this new lecture series. And so here we are finally at the first one. 
And of course, there could be no more fitting person to give the first Hoki uh, lectures than, than, than Omar, uh, Professor Omar Yagi of the University of California, Berkeley. Um, you know, we often say that people need no introduction, and Omar almost certainly doesn't, but just in case you don't know, Omar began his academic career here at ASU in 1992. 1999, he moved to the University of Michigan, the Robert Parry Professor of Chemistry. In 2006, to UCLA as the Chris Foote Professor of Chemistry. And since 2012, he's been the James and Nilty Tretter Care Chair and Professor of Chemistry at UC Berkeley. He's a senior faculty scientist at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. He's the founding director of the Berkeley Global Science Institute. I have to read all this stuff, there's so much. The co-director of the Cavalry Energy Nanosciences Institute and the California Research Alliance. Omar's obviously most well known for the invention, the design, the synthesis of MOFs, COFs, and many other structures which fall under the larger umbrella now of reticular chemistry. It's not the only thing he's done. He's also responsible for the invention of the field, molecular weaving, and many others. I have a list right, of wars that Omar has won, and it's very long. I'm not going to go through them all. I'll just pick one or two. 1998, he won the Solid State Chemistry Award of the American Chemical Society when he was still at ASU. 19, 2009, the Material Chemistry Award for the American Chemical Society. He's a AAAS Newcomb Cleveland Prize Award winner won the Royal Society of Chemistry Centenary Prize, the Japanese Society of Coordination Chemistry International Award, the Albert Einstein World Award of Sciences. He's received the Wolf Prize, the Aminoff Prize, and just this year, the Royal Society of Chemistry Sustainable Water Award, which connects to the title of the talk. We really appreciate Omar taking the time to come visit us. He told me this is the first time he's given a public lecture since the pandemic, so we appreciate that. And uh, we'd like to recognize the occasion, actually, by giving Omar a little small plaque. So, Omar, please. A small plaque to recognize this. And the plaque has the infamous MOF 5 right there. Uh -huh. There we go. So, Omar Yagi, University of California, Berkeley. Reticular chemistry materials for water harvesting from air anytime, anywhere, November 9, 2021. The O'Keefe Lecture Series. So, Omar, thank you for coming. Please, we won't shake hands, but you can take this. Smile for the camera. Thank you. So with that, Omar, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, for that uh, nice introduction and also um, introducing the O'Keefe Lectureship. It's real pleasure to be here on many, many levels, not the least of which is uh, really to speak on behalf of uh, Michael O'Keefe and my collaborations with him in inventing a new branch of chemistry. Um, highly understated, but nevertheless, I will uh, express it in my own, in my own words. I, I think it's, a, it's also a really nice of SMS to recognize one of its members in this, in this way. And uh, I hope that, um, that this tradition would, uh, will continue. So, no surprise, the title of my talk is Reticular Chemistry, and more specifically, the invention of reticular chemistry and the development of reticular chemistry, but also um, the outlet of this chemistry, one of the outlets among many, is the water harvesting from desert air. And when you can uh, harvest water from desert air, you can do it anywhere at any time of the year. So. My very first paper at ASU is this one. It doesn't have Michael O'Keefe on it. He wouldn't talk to me, actually, until I had published something. <laughs> so in 94, my idea was, let's link building units together with metal ions to make extended structures. And in fact, we made the first porous metal sulfides. This is, you're looking at it. That was done at ASU. And uh, I was very happy with this, with this development. But I went to visit Michael O'Keefe in his office to brag about my new result, okay? And 
And I just want to talk about the inspirational power of molecular models. If you knew Mike O'Keefe and you visited his office, you will see that it's completely decorated with different models because I think you can't actually study a structure without building a model of it. And so uh, Mike said, I, I was wondering what that model looks like. So this model ended up in my lab, but it really started in Michael O'Keefe's lab. And it's a structure that is known in minerals, but Mike had figured out that instead of, a, let's say, a silicon, you could have a cluster of atoms, and these cluster of atoms could be anywhere from the periodic table. As long as they maintain that geometry, potentially this could be made. And so he, he actually said this when I saw this model. I said, what is this model? He explained it to me. It was my very first time to see an extended structure, quite honestly. And, uh, and he explained it to me, and, and then he followed that by saying, I bet you can't make that. And that's not a testament necessarily that, that I was not a very good professor or scientist, but I think more that this was really a more of a blue sky research and it's not a very possible objective for a synthetic chemist. And I said, no, I bet you that I can make it. And I took the model with me and gave it to Halian Lee, as you see him here, my, my student. Well, it turns out that we made actually the even larger member of what Michael O'Keefe had imagined and that's shown here. This is a crystal structure of sodalite where the vertices, instead of having one tetrahedron, they have 10 tetrahedra. You see them here in 10 tetrahedra that have an overall tetrahedral geometry. And you can put them on the vertices of this mineral and actually make a porous, in this case, metal sulfide. Well, this was a whole new field of research right here. Okay, we published in Science in 99, and you can see here, Mike O'Keefe was a major contributor to this. In fact, this is Michael O'Keefe's drawings uh, on one of his uh, now very old-fashioned program, but nevertheless very beautiful program. And he put the yellow ball in there, which has become famous since then. It started out as a pink ball, purple ball, red ball, where there was a lot of debate, green ball, and then in the end, I made the decisive decision that the yellow ball should be uh, yellow because the, the ball should be yellow because that was Arizona State University's logo on the, on the logo. I think it's still on the logo. But in the meantime, the, the, that, this is the power of having models and discussing with colleagues who are interested in discussion. And uh, in the meantime, my students were busy doing stuff. And uh, you know, I'm a young assistant professor. When I joined ASU, I was only 26 years old. And Betty here in the front knows everybody's age. <laughs> and she can tell you for sure. But I was, I was 26 years old. And my students were making these kinds of compounds, where instead of a metal cluster, an inorganic metal cluster, they were linking organic units, such as these, by pyridine, neutral organic ligands. This is the fact that it's neutral becomes important later, linking them with copper one. And I looked at this and I said, oh gosh, this is, this is like the other hundreds of compounds that are out there in the literature. Why are you doing this research? And this student kept pushing this actually in front of me. This and other compounds, she kept pushing those in front of me, sh showing me X-ray powder diffractions of them, showing me single crystal structure. And I kept saying, I don't want to talk to you. Um, I, am, I want to get tenure, for God's sake. I want to focus on the metal sulfides. We've already, we've already been very successful with the metal sulfides, not these metal organics. The reason I was discouraged by the student's result or approach was that these metal organics made from very similar neutral linkers with copper one were reported back in 1959. And people have been making them since 1959. So I wasn't, and they were just, in my opinion, they were sculptures. They were not useful for anything. Once you got the crystal structure, you drew it, you admired it, and that was it. They didn't inspire new applications or use, as you will see, because they collapse. Once you start using the pores, 
you, they collapse. And this is another example just to show in 1986, same thing, neutral linkers linked by copper. And in 1989, Robson reported same kind of linkers, neutral linkers with copper one, made in exactly the same way to make diamond nets in the same way. No different. Same reaction, same metal, same kind of linker, and same underlying topology. But I want to pause here and say that many in the community like to think that Robson started the field of, of reticular chemistry or MOFs. And as you will see, you can judge for yourself, okay, uh, by the end of my talk. Because what, we, what I did, having colleagues like Peter Williams and Michael O'Keefe and uh, all these ambitious guys, Peter Busek and so on, I have to get tenure and I have to do something that makes a difference. And so to me, these were useless because I couldn't make them truly porous. They collapsed upon trying to use the pores. And, and, and so in the community, this community was called crystal engineering. In fact, in the US, you couldn't get a grant funded in this topic because it was really criticized by the establishment that this is not a, a viable field. So, so what we did, my training was in inorganic chemistry. And so I knew that if you use anionic links, such as these carboxylates, and link them to metal ions, if you could crystallize what we then called MOFs, then you would, then you would have strong bonds. You would have strong architectures. And therefore, you could potentially exploit the porosity. Again, I would like to point out that those same group here, Robson's group, in some of their papers I discovered years later, had written that in fact carboxylate frameworks, such as the ones we discovered in 95, would be impossible to crystallize. Unfortunately, they didn't have the nice students that I had in 95 at ASU. And so we were off to the races. We reported that in Nature, and everybody was excited. We were off in the direction of inorganic frameworks and these MOFs. So these structures that I showed you from previous to MOFs, they collapsed. They were not designable. This becomes very important in reticular chemistry, is that they are made from vertices that are single metal vertices, not aggregates. The carboxylates aggregated the metal, so now you have clusters that can direct the structure for you and make a stable structure. They're not chemically stable, and they are definitely not polymers. They're actually misnomer. So those coordination polymers containing neutral linkers are not viable for the things that I'm going to talk to you about. So, so immediately then, in 98, we had to show that, in fact, you can make a moth, not just crystalline, but that the pores can remain open in the absence of guests. And we use the strategy of carboxylates with metals to make these aggregates and link them up into extended structures such as what you see here. And I had a student, uh, a postdoc, come to me. His name is Muhammad Adaudi while I was at ASU. This structure was made by Halley and Lee. And then Muhammad Adaudi, as a postdoc, came to me. And I said to him, your job is to take this structure and see whether it's architecture robust by measuring the gas adsorption isotherm, which is done at 77 Kelvin. And it is the, really the gold standard for proving that your material can remain open in the absence of guests. And therefore, you could use the pores. This, was, this is the aspect that was missing in the field. I actually have the Ferry reports on this paper that basically said that. Um, so this SBU approach was so amazing. And later, Mike O'Keefe and I started thinking about the carboxylate carbon atoms as squares, as forming a square, so that now you have a square grid. So, and the way we made them was quite simple. You take the organic acid, you link it up with zinc plus, and this is, this is the key development here, is that you have a way to crystallize it under these conditions. I won't go through the, all the details of balancing the kinetics and thermodynamics of crystallization here that led us to single crystals. 
But Muhammad Adawdi's job, as soon as he appeared in my office, I said to him that your job is to measure the gas sorption isotherm. And he went to the lab and said, which was in the basement of Goldwater building here, he said, you don't have a machine that measures gas adsorption isotherms. And I said, well, build one. OK. So he went to the lab of Wagner. I think you remember Dave. Um, Wagner had nano balances that he used to use for catalysis to dose oxygen into his catalyst and measure how much oxygen using a nano balance. So he interfaced the nano balance with the um, Schlenk uh, line type uh, device uh, and really measured the isotherm. This is the very first isotherm that showed to the entire community that metal organics could be made to be porous. And, uh, and that's it. This basically gave the, the, this field that was full of, uh, full of what I would say sculptures, gave it um, a basis to go on and make frameworks that are now useful. Because now you can remove the gas and put new ones in. The new ones could be hydrogen, methane, whatever, or you could functionalize the pores and do very specific transformations. So this meant everything. But um, there will always be people who say, I've done it first. But then when you look in detail, they haven't done it. They just have done some experiment, looks like the right experiment, but it's not. And, and this is one of them. Somebody took this compound and pressurized it with gas at room temperature. That's not a gas adsorption isotherm. You can pressurize any object, even my tie, and it will take up gas. OK, so that doesn't prove porosity, permanent porosity. That doesn't mean that I can evacuate on the molecular level the material and put new ones in. So, but this remains until today. Uh, people say, uh, not people, but these authors saying that they prove porosity. That doesn't prove porosity, especially since from this data, you cannot get the porosity data, which is surface area and pore volume. You can't use this data to do that. You need the gas adsorption isotherm. And this is the measurement that everyone now uses, this here, in the MOF field. Every MOF that is being used today is based on uh, metal carboxylates, and it's characterized by gas adsorption isotherm in the way I see it here. OK, so Mike O'Keefe used to sometimes pass by my office in the basement of Goldwater on his way to his office, which was in the physical sciences building. And this particular morning, I had forwarded him a crystal structure of a new compound we discovered. OK? And that compound, in response, and I said, what did you think of the structure? And he said, this is so beautiful, it will be the best thing you've ever done. And little did he realize that we will do much more than that together. And that's really the magic of that collaboration. That compound was what we called MOF5, OK? So MOF5 was discovered in my lab at uh, Halian's initiative of linking metal oxide units with organic linkers or doing the reactions that would produce these metal oxide units. And this was really the beginning of the, the true beginning in the eyes of the public of, of, um, of the community of, of the MOF field because the surface area when we measured the gas adsorption isotherm was so high that people, when we published this paper, people thought it was a misprint surface area is 2,900 meters square per gram. In the basement of Goldwater, when the students, they had not slept for a whole night, Muhammad and Halian, measuring this um, point by point, because you have to wait until each, each dosing of the gas has equilibrated and, the, and you have a constant uptake measurement. And so it took them all night. And I said, is it reproducible? And of course, they thought, oh gosh, not another night. <laughs> OK, they keep reminding me of that until today. So we made sure it's reproducible. And on top of that, I wasn't going to say to the world, I just broke the 1,000-year record held for porosity by carbon without sending it, let's say, to an independent 
company at the time in Georgia to confirm that the surface area was uh, what we think it is. Actually, the numbers always hovered above 2,900 because we didn't, in those days, we didn't quite understand the chemistry of the pore. We can evacuate the pore, but we could never figure out is it completely evacuated or not. It turns out that MOF-5 now, we can activate it so well that it has a surface area of almost 4,200 meters square per gram. But we went and reported the um, lowest number that we obtained just because as an assistant professor, I was worried that I might make a mistake. So anyway, it turns out to be higher than that. And now we have the concept of SBUs articulated by Mike O'Keefe and myself in that now you take the carboxylate carbons to have a primitive cubic structure. And once you know the conditions under which to make this, you could functionalize the linkers and make the same structure what we called in those days isoreticular structure, meaning having the same underlying net. Well, it didn't take Mike very long to recognize that basically any building unit that you could get your hands on, which could be a geometric unit, can be linked together into, into a network that he had described in his book, The Yellow Book, uh, that was already published when I joined uh, AS ASU. So we could take linkers that are benign, such as um, acetic acid or terephthalate, um, lactic acid, and make MOFs out of them. So you can make MOFs that are edible. Uh, it's, they've been eaten by some of Stoddard's students. And, and you can make MOFs from the most exotic linkers. So. So what, what this meant is that any linker, any cluster that you can imagine, you can get your hands on, you can make it into a MOF. Remember, these MOFs are, are structures that people said they could not be crystallized. And so you can imagine the excitement in the field. So like I said, uh, with Mike's thinking about using the building units at geometric objects, we were able to then these are Mike's drawings, actually. We were able to take squares when with the proper organic linker that can put these squares at a, the required angles, we could make zero-dimensional structures, chains, ladders, square grids, and three-dimensional structures. So, so all of a sudden, a linker like terephthalate became conveyor of geometric information so that you can make the moth that you desire. The, the, the um, terephthalate, depending on the angles between the carboxylates, whether it's the bending angle or the twisting angle or the folding angle, they were all now important information that can channel you into the desired structure. And um, needless to say, we were able to make all of those. We made the, this is the bent structure, puts the squares at 120 degrees together and make the first uh, nano, particle that has been characterized by single crystal X-ray diffraction. Okay, so this is a truncated cube octahedron. And I won't go through these, but you can see that we went through the, um, through the exercise of making sure we find or we design the right uh, linkers that provide you with the angles required to make those MOFs in those topologies. This is, a, this is a, scenario, a very nice scenario where here in this example, you have uh, the squares uh, could be, uh, so the squares here are in the same plane, so you make the square grid. And if you have one bromo or one halogen here, that puts the carboxylates at 90 degrees. And if you don't heat this MOF structure, uh, you'll be able to keep the carboxylates at 90 degrees, they won't overcome the barrier to rotation, and now you have a three-dimensional framework. Okay, so we showed the feasibility of making MOFs in crystalline form. We showed that you can take the interior of the MOF out and use the space inside. Okay, this uh, then was a, an emerging new field because anything a chemist can imagine, now we've shown that you can make. So. 
it was time to sit down and put a really a thinking basis for the field in terms of which geometric unit could give you which structures. And of course, you can imagine there's infinite number of structures that could be made in this way, depending on the geometry. So, so Mike came up with this idea that all structures can be viewed as collection of linkers and intersections. That allowed us to basically take any structure, no matter how complex it is, and reduce it into two components. One is the node, that's your branching intersection, and the other one is link. And depending on how these things came together, you made a net. And that net, Mike O'Keefe, who is called by many the net guru, was able to identify it or predict it. And so, so that's, this is done in his book. First, this idea of making nets from nodes and links was introduced by A.F. Wells and, and really perfected and applied by Michael O'Keefe in, uh, in his book. So, and we built a website that basically tells you which structure you're gonna make by combining which geometries together. That's the reticular chemistry structure resource. So how do you choose from among the millions and millions of possible structures, almost infinite number of possible structures? And uh, Mike uh, said, for the assembly of symmetric molecular shapes, only a small number of simple high symmetry structures will be of overriding importance, and they will be expected to form most commonly. Okay, so you're, as long as you're starting with symmetric units, you're probably gonna fall, very likely, fall in the most symmetric net. So that made life much easier for, for Mike to basically say, hey, if, if I want to know what the synthesis is gonna produce, I have to go after the most symmetric structures. And those turn out to be not many. It could be, you know, 50 or so for different geometries. And most of the time, he was correct. Sometimes he was not correct. We made things that were not as symmetric as he thought. But most of the time it was correct. It, 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 it became an intellectual framework to putting building units together, thanks to Mike's work. And we came up with what I call the periodic table of reticular chemistry. So if you're a student and you can think up building units, all you have to do is come to this table and say, okay, I've got triangles and this is what they're gonna give me. Uh, different geometries, and these were enumerated by Mike for many different geometries. Uh, progressively higher connectivity and higher complexity. And you can see here, for those in the audience who are interested in this field, there's still plenty of room for you to contribute by making some of these which have not been made yet. Okay. So the field started in 95 by the crystallization of the first MOF. They were named MOF at ASU in that paper. And in 99, because of the ultra high porosity that broke all records of porosity, that paper with Mike on that paper became, MOFs became uh, a sensation. And now in 2020, the research is being done on MOFs in over 100 countries around the world. So they've given a lot of inspiration to emerging scholars, to young people who want to enter chemistry, but also they are very seriously being researched by uh, groups either on making MOFs, studying MOFs, or applying MOFs in various um, uh, applications. Okay, so that was metal organic, and I was always I was, always, I was always excited by new frontiers. How do I build the next new frontier? MOFs, we were doing MOFs and we are still doing MOF chemistry, but I wanted, my excitement came from building the new frontier. And that we have always, I've always been interested in linking organic compounds together to make extended structures. And Roald Hoffman, back in 93, although I didn't discover this statement until much later, I wish I did, I would have put it in my proposals. Um, but he said that there is nothing, nothing in two and three dimension. There's no infinite extended organic structures that are covalently linked in two and three dimension. So it was wide open. Nobody has managed to crystallize anything for 
uh, organic compounds in two and three dimension because every time you did that, you got a powder diffraction that looks like this. And a chemist can't do very much with that. Okay, it's, it's very poorly crystalline or amorphous. So what we did in my group, we were able to turn this into a true crystalline material. And that's from this reaction, taking this diboronic acid and dehydrating it. You would think this is a simple reaction, which it is, but it doesn't make crystalline material. So it took the students many years to get this to work. And these are the magic conditions where water is produced in this reaction. And because you're running this in a sealed tube, you can control the pressure of water to control the reversibility of the reaction, therefore the crystallization of the cough. I can, I can talk for an entire lecture about the discovery of coughs because it is a true expression of the importance of the interaction between the professor and the student in a pleasant way. So that's, that's, that hump that I showed you turns into very sharp X-ray powder diffraction. That was cough one, the very first cough we published in 2005 and this is the structure that we obtained from uh, X-ray powder diffraction. Uh, three-dimensional structures could be made by, make, by starting out with three-dimensional uh, four-connected tetrahedral, let's say, uh, building units and dehydrating that to make triangles as links and the, the organic links that you put in. The nice thing about coughs is that unlike moths, what you put in does not change. They're only linked together through one bond or one form, they don't really uh, decompose and come together again. So they're very predictable. And because Mike had worked out which nets were gonna produce from which building units, it was easy for us to link them together and then look at the powder diffraction and match it to the simulated powder diffraction that we got from the predicted structures. That's why you see Mike's name on some of these uh, cough papers. These are the nets that Mike had predicted for uh, joining triangles with tetrahedra. The, these are the two most symmetric possibilities and both of them we made by matching the simulated X-ray powder diffraction to the experimental powder diffraction. That gave, that gave us the initial model to, to, to refine the structure. This turns out to be one of the least dense materials known to date. It's entirely composed of boron, oxygen, and carbon linked by covalent bonds. Well, that field, now, just recently, we were able to make something that Mike said that, I, that he would retire if I could link molecules by carbon-carbon bonds, okay? He said something more severe than that, but, <laughs> but anyway. So, so we did, and the conditions that we used for the initial coughs were modified, but now adding trifluoroacetic acid, a very strong acid, to reverse the reaction, but still lock it down into this incredibly stable structure. This is a carbon-carbon bonded linker, and of course carbon-nitrogen, these are all very strong bonds. This is an amazing structure. No one would have predicted that you can do this under 150 degrees, under such mild conditions, or, or at all, actually. Because if you go to a very high temperature, you're going to decompose your cough. So this is the X-ray powder diffraction. And you can see that we use spectroscopy, NMR and IR, to make sure that the right linkages are being made. But look at the stability. You can take this cough and put it in concentrated HCl, saturated KOH, in, in water, in methanol, do whatever you want. Put it in corrosive and butyllithium, and the structure is unaffected. And that's what we expected with carbon-carbon bonded frameworks, okay? That was, that's the holy grail of coughs. So now the rest is just a lot of trials and errors to find the right conditions for other carbon-carbon bonded structures. But the path is already open. and. I don't want to just say that we solved those crystal structures by powder, but we also more recently have been successful in making single crystal structures 
or single crystals of these calves, large single crystals, okay? And you can see here the size is the same size that an organic chemist would have for their molecules, but this is an extended infinite structure. Avogadro's worth of unit cells that are linked together entirely by covalent, by covalent bonds. So, and thus the birth of what we call reticular chemistry. So in 2003, Mike and I wrote, a, I would say, a foundational paper that defined the parameters of the field. And the definition of reticular chemistry has three components. I don't know how you can actually see the future and write something of this kind that is still valid until today. This is just building blocks, strong bonds to make durable materials, building blocks to design structures, strong bonds to make durable materials that are going to harvest water from air year after year after year, and crystalline so that you can define your structure on the atomic and molecular level and know the, and understand the chemistry of that framework. So this is still valid until today, and I don't think anybody can modify it any better to make it fit what is happening today in the field. So that resulted in MOFs and COFs, and more recently, molecular weaving. This is another extremely exciting field. We discovered, we were the first to discover molecular weaving, and when I sent our paper to Michael O'Keefe, he was busy predicting the next generation of molecular woven structures. And I think he calls it now decusate chemistry, the chemistry of crossings. I, this is really, um, I'm not doing justice to the molecular weaving because it has, it does propel MOF chemistry into the uh, making materials that have incredible mechanical um, uh, strength. And, um, and uh, but this is a topic for another, another um, so uh, I'd like to, to put now in context of the larger uh, chemistry and society what we have done together. We have made new materials, and new materials in general have tracked very closely with advances in human civilization. In fact, we humans refer to those as different ages, like Stone Age, to define the materials that we were using at the time. Bronze Age and Iron Age and Glass Age, Steel Age and Aluminum Age, and the Plastic Age. And the, the, the more we are able to design these and manipulate them on a finer and finer level, the better our lives got. Okay? So we have the molecular age, I would say, in the last century. That led us to pharmaceuticals, okay, mainly pharmaceuticals. And then I would say we are, and this is not ostentatious, this is, can be supported by evidence, <laughs> the reticular age, okay? Um, reticular age because it controls matter beyond the molecule into infinite 2D and 3D. That's, that's the materials world, but it's, it's well defined on the atomic and molecular level, and you can use molecular chemistry on the extended systems. So. Who could argue that this is not the reticular age? Okay, so, so we were awarded the um, Aminoff Prize, which is a very nice prize that is, it's, it states that those people who get it have done something beautiful and useful. And I think, I think that Mike O'Keefe's statement when we discovered MA5, it is so beautiful, and that is really true and there's nothing like it. So for, this is for the development of reticular chemistry. I'm, I'm especially honored to have received this prize with Michael O'Keefe. Okay, so now very quickly in the time remaining, I wanna just give you an idea of what some of the things that we have been doing with MOFs in terms of applications. I think that there are three stresses facing our planet. One of them is the stress of trying to use clean fuels like hydrogen, which burns with only water as a byproduct. That's a dream that, that potentially we can address, or that's a challenge that we can address. Uh, carbon dioxide, uh, a child born today 
breathes almost double the amount of carbon dioxide than one that was born before the Industrial Revolution. And that tells you the extent of the problem. And it's getting worse, and it's affecting our climate. And water, right? We'll talk more about water. In fact, I want to zip through hydrogen carbon dioxide with a couple of slides and then focus on water. But fortunately, we have the periodic table. And with reticular chemistry, we have a way to stitch these elements together to make new materials that I believe are beginning to address this, uh, the, these challenges. Materials are going to become more and more complex, I think. And that's why reticular chemistry is so attractive to students, to young scholars, because it's all about control. It's all about the control on the atomic and molecular level. Once you're able to control matter on that tiny level, you can solve any problem as long as society has the will to put the resources behind it. But I don't think uh, we have failed in solving problems once we have that control and the resources to express it. And uh, here's an example of, I just like to give this example. Our cell phone has more elements in it than, than, our human, uh, than the body, human body, okay? And that just tells you we need to be able to control things more and more so that we can make uh, objects that are able to carry out complexity and that are durable and robust. That's reticular chemistry. That's a strong bond. OK, so one of the things that we have done is hydrogen storage. This is a moth in red. And the uh, white spots are the hydrogen molecules. And the idea is that. Instead of hydrogen filling a very large volume, we create a moth that could attract the hydrogen through electrostatic forces or polarization forces. And therefore, you can pack it on its internal surface and therefore stack the hydrogen molecules like you would, let's say, stack cars in a, in a car park. And here, you see how the um, hydrogen molecules are hovering in this uh, computation hovering around the MOF structure. And therefore, you're able to store more hydrogen per unit volume with the MOF than without the MOF. Even though the MOF occupies its own volume, you still can store more within the MOF than without the MOF. Except that you have open space here that's not doing you any good, right? That's, that's open space. So your, your fuel tank is going to be so much larger because you have this open space. But reticular chemistry can fix this because we know how to design materials that could self-catenate, again numerated by Michael O'Keefe. And that's, that's this structure. You could fill that space by having two independent frameworks come together and mechanically fill each other. That way now, I have introduced more adsorptive sites. I doubled my adsorptive sites per unit volume. And so this is the results of that experiment, where this is now at room temperature. We're taking up hydrogen over 1.5% by weight. Not a lot, but significant. And it's reversible, because it's not tied to the framework by covalent bonds. So let me just uh, make a long story short here, because this is an ongoing research. We are uh, right now with hydrogen, in terms of binding energy, the strength of interaction between hydrogen and the framework, we are at about 12 to 13 kilojoules per mole. And that gets you around 2% by weight. OK, not in this structure, but in another structure that has an exposed metal site. So 2 to 2.5 if you really use the right metal. But 2.5 is the absolute maximum of where we are right now at this binding energy. This is for MOF 5. So we have been able, through tinkering with the MOF, to get it to be stronger and store around 2 to 2.5 weight percent of hydrogen. We need to get to 20 kilojoules per mole to be able to store enough to make it interesting for automobile fueling. So 20 kilojoules per mole, that's the strength of a hydrogen bond, OK? But you can't go stronger, because then you have to put in heat to take it out. You can't go weaker, because then you can't store enough hydrogen. So that's, you know, for those of you who are interested in this problem, 
We need to think of strategies of how to functionalize the interior of the moth to increase the binding energy of hydrogen to the moth to, be, to go from 13 kilojoules per mole to 20 kilojoules per mole. Do you think it could be done? Or well, if anybody's going to do it, it's going to be in the moth field because we can control these on the molecular level. Okay, that's, that, I think that that's the key development here on a foundational, uh, at, at, the, at the fundamental, is that we can control matter in infinite direction on the at, uh, atomic and molecular level. Uh, CO2 problem is potentially more, it's complex problem to solve, but uh, it gives me even more hope than hydrogen. Uh, the problem is you could divide it into two, po uh, two uh, sides. One is binding CO2 from air, where it exists at around 400 ppm. That's not so easy because it's very dilute, so you have to process a lot of air and that has its own energetic and uh, uh, engineering challenges. And from power plants and point sources, depending on what your power plant is burning, it could be 5% CO2 emission if it's burning natural gas, but if it's burning uh, petroleum or, or um, coal, you, you could get up to 16% of CO2. In both cases, you're trying to separate CO2 from many other gases, not the least of which is water which competes with CO2 and so and complicates things. So these are the minimum requirements for a carbon capture material. You need to have high capacity so that you're not doing many cycles. You minimize the number of cycles by having a high capacity material because every cycle demands energy. Water stability. Your material needs to be able to be flooded in water and stable for many years in a power plant or in a device that's capturing CO2 from air. Oxidation stability, because you're, you have oxygen around and you're heating the material to remove the CO2. Um, that, the oxidation of amines and the oxidation of the framework is very important. Cyclability, you need to be able to cycle many, many times, hundreds of thousands of cycles. And you need to be able to have the right regeneration temperature. You need to be able to heat your material not to hundreds of degrees uh, Celsius, but, but to something that is more reasonable uh, to lower the energy requirements. So where are we in the carbon capture world? Okay, we are, we are here. There isn't an ideal material right now. They all have problems. They, they all have problems. The aqueous amines which have been used for 100 years to separate CO2 from uh, methane in natural gas mining is are, are problematic because the regeneration temperature is high, 120 degrees. They're not very cyclable, can't cycle too much because they decompose and they become problems in their own uh, environmental problems. And, and it means are corrosive. They're liquids, they're water, they're, they are aqueous. Uh, amines and, uh, and the heat capacity of water is high. So frameworks may be better or solids better because they have lower heat capacity. Carbon doesn't cut it. Zeolites have their own problems. Resins, organic resins are not bad, but they do have a problem with regeneration temperature. Silicas, as you can see here, they still have problems. Metal hydroxides have a, uh, they're solids, they're they have problems with high regeneration temperature. Moths seem to be approaching being interesting, right, as materials that could satisfy the three requirements. Cyclability for moth is still a challenge because after many, many cycles, somehow having the metal there still affects the hydrolytic stability of the material. But that's where, let me just say, that's where coughs are going to fill in. But we're learning a lot about CO2 capture even though moths may not, may not be the ideal materials down the road. And there may be smaller applications that can withstand lower number of cycles that moths could be useful for. But, but for power plant and this large scale applications, you're gonna to have to go with materials that are not gonna hydrolyze. Because remember, even when CO2, unlike binding H2 into the pore, CO2 is going into the pore with water binding to amines that you may have tethered onto the moth 
and, and evolving its own chemistry. Okay, you make acids, and it's constantly evolving within the pores as more and more CO2 is being pushed into the pore. So it's very, you have a, almost like a chemical plant into the moth. Um, and so the, the material has to, has to have a backbone that is extremely robust onto which you can bind amines and the things that you need for the CO2 selective capture. At the level where we are with MOFs, here's a MOF, it's a zirconium MOF, and we functionalized it with, a, with glycine, which has a CH2, NH2 unit onto which CO2 could bind from air. Okay, and how does this material perform? In air, here's 400 ppm, we can reduce, this is one kilogram of MOF, we can reduce that down to, as you can see here, down to 0 0.02 millibar or 20 ppm. So that's, that's not bad. You have a material that can take this up and we can cycle it over 80 cycles and it's fine. I'm not sure how many cycles we can do, but I'm worried. The flue gas is the same thing. 15% CO2, we can clean it down to less than 2% CO2. So you see right before you a prototype that has a MOF that can selectively bind CO2 and reduce the level of CO2 in air or in flue gas. And it works in water. And it can be cycled quite a few cycles. Now, will it cycle hundreds of thousands of cycles? I don't know. My guess is that it's going to be complicated. That's why the push should be towards coughs. Okay. The other... Um, problem I want to talk about is the problem of uh, water stress in the world. And all the regions that are not yellow are experiencing water stress in one way or another, either for the lack of rain or because they're overusing the underground water. So that's one third of the world as of today lives in water stressed regions. And even in the water regions, there's always questions about how pure is my water. And then um, it's also a national security problem for many countries because many of them do import their water. Okay, so you don't want to rely on another country for your water. Um, so in 2040, the UN projects that this picture will get even worse. Countries that you think are not water stressed or regions of countries where you think are not water stressed, like the Midwest of the US or the East Coast, will be water stressed because we're overusing the underground water much uh, faster than it could, be, it could be replenished. So our idea is that the air contains a lot of water. And in fact, uh, we have almost 13,000 cubic meter kilometers of water in air at any one time. That's as much water as we have in lakes and rivers on our planet. It's a lot of water. But we don't have a way to extract that water in an energy efficient way. Now MOFs come in because you can design the interior to have the right binding energy for water. And so we think that potentially this is something that we can address. Um, in fact, water harvesting is probably the furthest along among the hydrogen CO2 problems. Um, now there's a lot of stuff out there on harvesting water from air because this is an idea that has been around for a thousand years. Okay, and uh, if you Google water harvesting, you'll get all these things that people were trying to sell you as harvesting water from air. And none of them work. They all work at high humidity, not at the humidity levels where you really need them to work, which is less than 50. In the desert, usually 20 to 30% relative humidity, okay, depending on the uh, time of year. So these, all these systems work on cooling the air down to get the water out. Okay, we're gonna do something different. We think that if we can have a moth that extract water from desert air at low humidity, it would work anywhere in the world. Right? It will work better at higher humidity. So that's the idea, that's the vision. Could we harvest water from air anywhere in the world at any time of the year? And to make you appreciate, and so that you don't buy those equipment online, to thinking that you're gonna get pure water in the middle of the desert, 
I just want to give you an illustration. This is a psychrometric chart plotting the amount of water in air versus temperature. Okay? If, if I am in a region of the world that is here, 30, where there's 30 degrees C and 20% relative humidity, that's very dry. Okay, not much water is in, the, is in that air. Now, for me to, re, to get the water out of that air, I need to reduce the temperature down to 4 degrees Celsius of the air. And David is nodding his head because he's an engineer. He understands that very well. That's energy-intensive process. You can't make devices that you're going to sell to people and, and address the water stress. However, if I have a moth that can seek out that water, pluck it out of the air, concentrate it into the pore, now I've created humidity in my environment and I have 80% humidity. And so for me to get that water out, I only need to reduce down the temperature or for me to condense that water would, would require me to reduce the temperature by four degrees to get the water out of that air. Okay, so in a way, the moth being able to concentrate the water from air into its pores creates, let's say, humidity in a device so that you have a humid, so that you take, let's say, arid air, desert air, and turn it into a uh, tropical air. Okay, now you can get the water out much more easily. That's how the moth works, and, and I don't want to belabor the point, but there's, again, there's a lot of fluff out there about water harvesting and a lot of claims that when you look deeply into what they're claiming, it's not quite right, okay? You need to have a high capacity material. You need a material that can take the water in and out with great facility so that you're not putting in a lot of heat to, to do that. And you need the material to work at low humidity. Otherwise, we already have water in, in the more humidified region, or it's not as urgent. So there's nothing out there that works. And what works uh, here is MOF. The way we discovered this is that we were studying the interaction of water to MOFs as part of the CO2 capture problem. And we discovered this MOF to have this incredible behavior when exposed to uh, water. It takes up water at 20% relative humidity, and it takes it up in a step way. And so that means for me to take the water out, uh, I, can, I can have a very high working capacity because of the step. If this was shallow, your working capacity would be very low and would require more energy. So we discovered that you can take the water out at 45 degrees, which is having been born and raised in a desert environment, that's the temperature during the day could go up to 45 degrees. So that gave me the idea that moths could be used for harvesting water from desert air. And indeed, you can do this for many, many cycles, and the moth is maintained. Moth structures, many of the performance is maintained. The only thing that we notice is that there's a slight drop in performance or in uptake after the first cycle. What was that? And now comes why are we working so hard to make crystalline materials? Is that it does have, aside from the obsession of Mike O'Keefe and Omar Yagi with crystals, there is a practical thing. And that is now we can dig into the structure and find out where those first water molecules are residing and what's their interaction with the framework. It turns out the very first water molecules are bound closely to the metal oxide unit. And so when you're doing the cycling, these, I call them seeds, are not removed. They are stuck to the metal oxide unit through strong hydrogen bonds. But what you're removing are the water molecules that are bound to the seed. So in a way, you have a, an ice fragment growing inside the moth at room temperature. And that's what we were cycling. We were cycling the additional water molecules that are bound to those, to those seeds. Well, that's great. Right? Now we have figured it out, and we can do better. Right? But before that, we wanted to show that this thing works in the desert. Okay, so we designed, a, a, uh, in, in collaboration with Evelyn Wang at MIT, we designed a handheld device that employs two grams of water. And the device works by, you, you open the device during the night for air to get into the moth. Water gets into the moth. You close it during the day, expose it to sunlight, it heats up, and water comes out of the moth and condenses on the walls. And that's, 
And you can see here the droplets of water as the interior heats up, 50, 60 degrees, and so on. You get the droplets are getting larger and larger. Okay? So not much water is coming out, but we are only using two grams. But it works. It works outside the lab. In, in this particular case, this was done in, in uh, humidity of 25 to 30% relative humidity. This, is, this experiment was done in Arizona, in the Arizona desert, and you can see the droplets that were harvested from that device. So Evelyn and I went our own way because MIT gave her a whole bunch of money and said, Yagi can't work with you because he's not an MIT professor. Mm -hmm. so, so I said, fine, I mean, we can design a device, a simple device to do this, no, no problem. Okay, so a Berkeley device has, is based on a kilogram of moth, and it's a box within a box. Okay, the, the outside box is your condenser, the inside box has the moth, it works in exactly the same way, desert air comes into the moth, traps the water, the, water, the moth gets saturated, you close the outside, you expose it to sunlight, and you get condensation of water as the water is moving out of the moth. Okay, from this experiment, which by the way, this is, I think this is Betty's backyard right here that this box is sitting on. So I called Betty and I said, Betty, we need, the students need to test this kilogram device in a desert environment. <laughs> Could we borrow your backyard? And Betty and, uh, and John were gracious to host the three students. And this is what the device looks like. It's, it's two plexiglass boxes that are, you can see how ASU is in my blood. Okay, so, so uh, ultimately the student, I didn't tell you Betty, but I called them up at two o'clock in the morning and they said, oh, the experiment is not working. We see, we see that the, because they have probes into the moth and everything, we see that the moth is getting saturated with water, but, and we see it coming out as vapor, but it doesn't condense. I said, just put it under the ground. Put part of it under the ground, and the uh, dirt is probably two degrees, three degrees lower in temperature than the rest of the device. It should condense. And indeed, then that worked, right? So it pays to call your students at two o'clock in the morning. Um, so this, these are the three students who were uh, doing this experiment in uh, Betty's backyard. You can see here the um, production is 200 milliliters to 300 milliliters, that's, a, run, that's, a, more, that's a, a cup of water. This is 236 milliliters, so it's a drink of water from a kilogram, completely unoptimized, and then we discovered that not all the moth is being used because air has to diffuse further down into the cake of moth, but now we've gotten a lot better, as you will see, in, in exposing the moth to um, all right, ready. air. So this is Eugene, Three. Um, you yeah. met him, Betty. He drank the water without Cheers. my advice. Uh, <laughs> nice. The water is pure. We tested the water for using the um, FDA standards for drinking water, and it has no metals, no organics. It's, it's, it's distilled water, okay? So it doesn't really taste as good as this water, but to make it taste like this or even better, you mineralize the water. All our water is mineralized. It's very easy, cheap process. So this is very, very exciting because you have a material, a simple device. You can generate water without any energy input aside from ambient sunlight. And we learned a lot by going to the desert and, and doing all those experiments and understanding all the heat transfer airflow and temperature changes that are happening in the, in, in the device. So that, so then as we published that paper, everybody said, oh, zirconium is too expensive. And that's true. And so we went, and that's the nice thing about reticular chemistry, we went and designed aluminum moth. Aluminum is cheap. Uh, O'Keefe had already enumerated rod-based SBUs, and this is one of them. Uh, MOF CO3, we designed that. We, we, uh, it turns out to have extraordinary uh, uptake and it works at 10% relative humidity. And it works better than the zirconium MOF. Okay, I'm, I, um, I just want to say that 
we took the, a kilogram of that moth to the desert, Mojave Desert, and you can see here the humidity in the desert at this time of the year when we tested this and the uptake of water. The, ignore the first bar because that's the water that was in the moth when we were in Berkeley, but this is in the, in the desert. And you can see that even at very low humidity, less than 10% relative humidity here or 10% relative humidity, it still picks up water. Okay, so, and my students know not to return without the evidence of water, real evidence of water being picked up from air. And so this is a video of, of the, this is part of a longer video that shows how the water is dripping into the container. And from this experiment, we can harvest one liter of water per kilogram of moth per day at a humidity that range from five to 35 uh, relative humidity. I said 10%, but you see there's a very short hump at the beginning, that's 5%. But largely the moth works at 10%, but if you have 5%, it does pick up some water. So the nice thing about this is that the moth stays in the device for many years, <coughs> right? Because we've already tested this moth over 36,000 cycles, and it leaves the water leaves no imprint on the moth. The moth performance is reproducible. And the very nice thing about this is that the water comes out of the pore with great facility. At 85 degrees, you can remove the water from the pores in less than uh, five minutes, okay? Just a few minutes. If you, want, if you don't want to go to 85, you can go to 60, but that means you have to do more cycles or slower cycles, excuse me. Based on that, you can do an electrified device like this. It looks complicated, but it's not. It's just made on the same principle that I showed you before, from which you can harvest uh, four liters of water, but not kilogram of moth, 200 grams of moth. This is the water harvesting chamber. Door opens, allows air in. It condenses, it, it's, it's into the moth, then the moth is heated, condenses, it's collected at the bottom. And then you see the water filling up the, the bottle there. This is the water at the bottom. Okay, so let me, let me just say that from this experiment, we, we are using 200 grams of moth in here, only 200 grams and producing four, and depending on the weather, five liters of water a day. The water is ultra pure because the moth is a filter, molecular filter in itself, and it does not, uh, let's say, leach any uh, metals or organics. And you can see that because we can control matter on the atomic molecular level, we can, in, in not a very long time, really achieve a much higher productivity. Now we are looking at the prospect, now we are here at around 80 liters per kilo of moth per day. We should be able to get to 100 liters per kilogram of moth per day. Okay, well, this is my, one of my last, I guess, my last slide. If, if, like I said, if the moth works, it will work in any kind of weather because it, this one works at 5%, mainly 10% relative humidity. And so in the driest desert in the world, at the driest time of the year, this, uh, material would pick up uh, about seven or so liters of water per day for, for each kilogram of moth. And you can do this in all parts of the world, okay? Because arid or humid weather, the humidity here and the temperature doesn't change based on where you are necessarily in terms of the behavior of the material. So. That's, that's where we are. I think that we are realizing the, the, um, the fact that you can harvest water from air anywhere at any time of the, of the year. Um, the fact that these are highly crystalline allows us to incrementally introduce water and then check where the water is residing inside the structure. And let me just zip through this and give you the video. So these are all based on crystallography. This is one of the pores, and we're going to 
um, uncover the pore so that you can see where the water is going. That's the first adsorptive size, second, third, and fourth, okay? And then it fills up. That, that's, those are our seeds. And then it fills up. Now you're building an ice crystal in the pore. All of these positions are crystallographically uh, defined. The reason this is exciting is that once, like, like all chemists know, do, once you know where, what the site that you want to modify, you can go in and make the binding stronger or weaker. Okay, and so we could use linker like this instead of the one with nitrogen to shift the isotherm if we want towards taking water at higher humidity. I don't know why you would do that if you have that. Maybe this is more energetically favorable if indeed all your conditions are gonna be around there. But, but more importantly, you can then modulate at which temperature you can take out the water by crafting in which atoms are being bound to, to water molecule, uh, to the framework. Okay, so this is the end, this is the end of my talk. Uh, before I get any questions about me taking water out of air and leaving us all dry, I just want to say that we, if you serve 50 liters to each one in our population, we would have only used less than 0.001% or 2% of the water in the atmosphere. We have lots of water in the atmosphere. On a fundamental level, what we are doing is we are making distributed water mobile of grid. And of course, you can personalize, you can mineralize it, you can make it flavored if you like. And it's pure, pure drinking water. You can, you can uh, use it for household uses, for agriculture, and above all, we can achieve hopefully water independence by using this kind of methodology. Michael O'Keefe has played a major role, I think, in the development of beautiful structures. So this is a symposium that we held for beautiful structures for Mike and defects for uh, Osamu, who spent his lifetime working on defects. This, this was held in Vietnam, part of our Global Science Institute activities to bring in people from developing countries into science and research. And I just wanna say that Mike never hesitated to jump on an airplane and go to very far places and spent a week to mentor students or giving them lectures. And I appreciate that very much. He also, um, has never hesitated to interact with my students in a, in a productive way, as you see here on one of the boats that they surprised me for my 50th birthday uh, with Mike. And there is Lita keeping everything in order and running smoothly. <laughs> Thank you, Lita, for your support. And ASU is a very special place to me because I met some people who have really impacted my life in the beginning, and it, and it had tremendous impact on my career. One of them is Morton Monk, he's sitting there in the back, who always said, whatever you need, Omar, I will provide. Okay, and I called upon him several times to help me, and he did, no hesitation. It takes courage to do that, and uh, it's, it, in the end, it translates into, into big impact. Betty Landon, she made sure everything is in order, and everybody knows their age and not to exaggerate their age. So thank you, Betty, for, all, for your friendship and all your service to our, uh, to our department. Okay, in the end, I want to acknowledge my students. Uh, in addition to those I acknowledge during my presentation, my, our funding and partners, and also say that we have, you have two textbooks that describe reticular chemistry. One is based on structures and nets, that's by Michael O'Keefe and Bruce Hyde, and the other one we just published in my group on an introduction to reticular chemistry. It's a textbook designed for undergraduates to follow the synthesis structure properties and applications of, of reticular chemistry. And I'll end with this. Statement from Mike, there has been nothing like it in the history of chemistry. Moffs, coughs, I think the interaction with Mike, I think that it's, uh, it, it's been a, a wonderful journey and we will continue on that, on that course. Thank you very much for your attention and for doing this.
Well, well, thank you. Spectacular presentation. Uh, we do have a reception outside, which you're all invited to. Before we go, I think it's only fair that we allow Omar to answer at least a couple of questions. So I'd like to open the floor just for a couple of questions. So please. Pete. So Omar, uh, thank you. That's wonderful. So with this distributed production of water, which is a glorious idea, it seems to me that there's got to be a massive industrial scale synthetic job. Do you have an idea of the scale of that and the cost of making an impact with this beautiful technology? Just so everybody understand who the question Pete's asking about industrial scale manufacturing of these materials? Well, the MOFs have already been, you know, we worked with BSF for many years, 17 years, to show that MOFs can be scaled up to multi-ton quantities. That is already being done in water and in a synthetic procedure that allows you to take the linker and the metal, combine them, and then get the linker and the metal into the product, no byproducts. So it's a completely uh, cyclable process. And at the end of this, the journey of the MOF, let's say in the device, you can add acid to the MOF, separate the metal from the linker, and then reassemble it in water, in water. So this has already been done. And so what else do we need? Okay, do you want devices that are engineered to trap water? from the atmosphere using the MOF, where the MOF now um, is, getting, uh, is, is being placed in a form. It's not powdered MOF in the, in the device, but it's placed in a form that is like a coating on a substrate to maximize the exposure of the MOF to, to air and so that you can take advantage of the full surface area that the MOF provides you. I just showed you a device. The, the beautiful thing about this device is that you can now correlate the molecular aspects that we work so hard with, with the, not just the substrate, uh, the MOF being on the but also the performance of the device. And the reason tiny changes into that adsorptive site are very important is because you're doing many cycles. So even if I could improve the adsorption energy or the kinetics by a tiny amount that is insignificant in the eyes of all chemists. The device performance is improved in that study I showed you, 15%. Right? That's, a lot of, that's a lot of water. In a, in a device that we envision in, um, that delivers 20,000 liters of water to a village, that just means so many more people that can, get, that can get water. So I think in terms of scalability, it's no different than any other new technology. Polymers, rem remember polymers when they were first discovered, people said they're not scalable. They're made from very expensive starting materials and so on. But if you create a need, uh, then a demand, uh, the, the rest follows. The technology works, that's my point, yeah. Vladi has a question. Yeah. <clears throat> Omar, uh, really beautiful talk. So I have a question. You talk about application for water production. Now, the MOF, they have also very interesting properties when it comes to electronic and transport, electric transport. So it and it's been trunks. Would you comment something on that? Yeah. The, the question is about MOFs, uh, relevance to electronics and conductivity and charge, charge transport. We've done a lot of work on coughs in that direction. You can take a cough that is layered and through the stacking you can get um, charge transport as good as uh, graphene. Okay, so there's a lot of work being done in that in that right, on conductive MOFs, on transport through MOFs. Um, I think there we are looking for ways of taking the coughs and making large areas of layers, right? So, so that they could be made useful in uh, in electronic applications and the applications that you're suggesting. 
So I would say that just depends on the building units and there's a lot of work that's being done there. You wanna? Don. Uh, I have a technical question, uh, the most beautiful stuff. Um, about hydrogen storage material, I, I'm a little bit confused. As so uh, by making this interplanetary metal structure, I thought you wanted to increase the capacity, but then actually heat of absorption increased. So uh, no, no, the heat absorption. Uh, no, I didn't. I was not clear. Uh, the question is about the interpenetration. Whether that increased the heat of absorption. That that's not actually true. Well, the heat of absorption is the absorption is the energy of the hydrogen onto the framework by doubling the up the. By, by doubly interpenetrating that structure, I close that open space that's not doing me any good, right? Because the, wa because the hydrogen is, no, is not interacting with the surface, and so it's still as if the hydrogen is outside the moth. So by introducing uh, another framework in, now I've introduced more adsorptive sites, just like the ones I already had, but filling up that volume. The adsorption energy does not increase in that situation because the nature of the absorption sites are exactly the same. They just doubled. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, actually, I think we'll give Petra the last question and then Omar is going to be outside. We can ask questions of Omar then. So, Petra, please. It's actually more global question because you mentioned that you can bring water to the villages which have no electricity and no water. So, but then you ideally would be your heating and cooling device. So, then how you mentioned that electricity for driving device would, would you then install solar panels? Or, because the more complicated the device is, the lower is the living time and maintenance I, time. I think, I think if you're, in, yeah, good question. The question is about how are you going to use this device without electricity, uh, without electricity in remote areas where there is no electric. But I mean, I showed you in the Arizona device that you could do this without without uh, input of power, aside from sunlight. The way the door can open and close, engineers have materials that have actuators that could, that could do that, depending on temperature. So I think it's doable. But I, I just showed you how I can harvest from one kilogram unoptimized, and not all the kilogram is being used, one cup of water a day. This could be a device sitting in a corner somewhere, 100 kilos of this stuff sitting in a corner some, uh, someplace and constantly harvesting water. It could be significant for remote areas. In fact, I feel like that application is much more impactful in the long run because of the, the fact that it's running on ambient sunlight um, much more than the electrified device. But in, yeah. Because you mentioned that your device at Becky's, Becky's backyard first didn't work uh, because it was not on the ground. So one idea would be to bury let's say two-thirds of the device in the ground. Exactly. So then you could also do this practically. You would, you would harvest in the ground, <clears throat> and then you would, would uh, release the water practically in the sun, sunshine exposing. And this would work even in the desert, because when you go deeper in the ground, it gets cooler and cooler. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that that's, that's really the idea. I'm, I'm not suggesting that we could just take that box, a box within a box and put it out there. I'm just showing that the feasibility of, of that, but there is some engineering that has to be done, but not requiring power that, that needs to happen in order for this to work in a, uh, you know, in a reliable device. Yeah. Reliable meaning that the mechanics of it is, is not, nothing's gonna break and it does not require constant maintenance. Yeah. Okay, I think we should thank Omar again for an absolutely spectacular presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.